We're live. Dang. All right. Hello, everybody. This is Small Axe Talks. Uh, been back, or it's been a while since we've been back here, but uh, I'm here with uh, John Auger. Thank you very much, man, for uh, joining me. And um, Happy to be here, brother. Yeah, cool. Hell yeah. So uh, John is a uh, attorney here in, uh, in Phoenix, and he has a, um, uh, a law firm, I guess, uh, with uh, another gentleman, Mr. Sandwig. Bill Sandwig. Uh, yeah, Sandwig and Auger. And um, they specialize in uh, medical malpractice, personal injury, as well as wrongful death, um, which I honestly don't know a lot about uh, that particular industry and, yeah. and that type of law. But if you don't mind, I'd like to start with just um, a little bit about uh, your background. I saw online that you went to USC and U of A as well. So. UC Berkeley. Oh, UC Berkeley. Yeah, that's right. I'm sorry. So can you tell us a little bit about, you're from Arizona, but you went out to California for a while, right? From Arizona. I was yeah. uh, born in, well, born in Las Vegas, moved here when I was about four years old. Uh, grew up here. My parents uh, were from, my dad's from Germany. My mom's from Wisconsin. They met in the Southwest and decided to stay here. And uh, I ended up here in Phoenix and have lived here you know, nearly all of my life. Awesome. So, uh, why did you why did you decide to go to 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 UC Berkeley? And what were you studying when you sure. were there? Yeah. Um, well, a couple of reasons. Um, I was a swimmer when I when I started out in college, and uh, I was okay at it. And they had a reasonably good swim team, and uh, you know, uh, pretty much the best swim team in the country, actually. And uh, I was a small, small, small part of that uh, for about a year or so, and that was something that I I wanted to pursue and decided that I was going to really go more the academic route, and I ended up uh, double majoring in uh, rhetoric, which is the study of public discourse, a little bit of philosophy, a um, little bit of history, um, you know, uh, a lot of reading, and also uh, a, a sort of a design your own major uh, program, which uh, was legal and political theory for me, and you have a special advisor that helps you uh, through that to pick a course program that's going to you know, hopefully satisfy um, the requirements that you really are sort of self-imposed uh, in that type of a major. Um, and that's how, I, uh, that's how I got to California. So when, when were you there? What, were the, what was the time period that you were in? Uh, I graduated in 1991 from, from UC Berkeley. That's when and I was then, born. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, but you're just a pup. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what, what was that like, that time period in California? Was that oh, boy. enjoyable, uh, that experience? Of course, uh, you know anybody who's fortunate enough to go to college and and to be able to uh, experience that that lifestyle, whether you're working or uh, uh, just taking classes. I worked a lot in college. Uh, it was all just a tremendous growing experience as a young person to be able to evolve and develop and uh, explore your ideas and in, in an academic environment that mm -hmm. uh, also allows for social experimentation. I think it was just. For me, it was a it was a good fit. What did you do, like work wise, like jobs? Did you have? Uh, well, I um, I primarily worked as a parking lot attendant really? in, uh, for the university, which actually was a reasonably good job. Uh, there were a number of full time people, and they had some students that uh, were essentially equals to the full timers, and mm. uh, you made a pretty good uh, uh, a pretty good wage for a student at that time, and uh, and you were allowed to do homework most of the time. It's not mm -hmm. uh, a, a terribly intensive uh, intellectual endeavor doing the, uh, you know, watching cars drive by and collecting money. So yeah. You cool. Know. It was just something, something to do while you're, while you're in college. So, uh, well, besides that you need to, you know, make money to live. But yeah. <laughs> Did you do it like all no. on your own as far as like going to school? Uh, like you, you know, primarily, I mean, uh, you know, I had, uh, I certainly had, I had some help along the way from my folks, mm. uh, but you know, I had some, some responsibilities that were on me as well. And, mm. uh, it was a good mix. Mm. Uh, and I was, I was very fortunate to, to have that mix. Yeah. Awesome. So a after you, you graduated, you, you came back here to Arizona, right? No, I worked for two okay. years as an educational consultant for a fraternity that I was in, in college, a social fraternity. Uh, drove all around the country, uh, uh, Texas and Oklahoma for one year, and then the Pacific Northwest for another year, and wow. visited uh, the various fraternity chapters that we had on college campuses and tried to help them with their educational programming, uh, financials, um, the relationship with the international fraternity. And uh, you know, those were kind of the things that we, 
that we were supposed to do as educational consultants for this group. Okay. What was that like? Was that an enjoyable boy? You know, uh, how can that not be? Yeah, uh, you're, you know, uh, you're, you're with young people. You're a young person. Uh, you're helping them develop. You're able to share your knowledge and experiences. Uh, you're almost a peer, but not quite. Hmm. Uh, and it's like anything else in life. It's a new experience every week as you travel around and and get to explore uh, new college environments when you're not so far removed from it. What was the the fraternity? Kappa Sigma. Okay. And I'm sure you still keep in contact with a lot of, a lot of these people. That, uh, I'm not as active as I would like to be on the international level. I was okay. for quite some time uh, after I first graduated. Mm. Uh, but uh, it's a lifelong endeavor. Uh, mm. It's a lifelong bond. And the friendships that I made uh, both at UC Berkeley and uh, as a consultant for the fraternity are enduring. And uh, they'll be uh, friends that I have forever, for sure. Mm. That's awesome. That's very cool. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I went to, I just went to like community college for a short period mm -hmm. of time. So I didn't experience like a lot of the more, you know, the normal, the normal things, you know, that people do in this country when they grow up and they go. So I, I always think the fraternity thing is an interesting experience and it sounds like something you would recommend to people, right? Uh, I, I think it's, uh, for me, it's been a good experience. My daughter is about to go to Barrett at, uh, ASU, mm -hmm. uh, in about a month and a half and. She's going to uh, at least go through what they call the rush process for the sororities. I don't know that she's uh, as engaged in that or as interested in that as, as perhaps I was at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think over over time, and this is probably subject for a different matter, but uh, fraternities and I think the things that they do have evolved considerably since I was in college or since you have the, the sort of... Uh, a lot of people think about the movie Animal House. You may be yeah, too oh young yeah. to remember that. <laughs> you know, that that uh, that really shaped public perception of the of those types of organizations in a, in a really kind of a bad way. Like for it's a just long a time. party, a big party. Type yeah, thing. yeah, and uh, it's uh, you know just just very uh, hedonistic lifestyle. Mm. Uh, it's not really like that uh, anymore uh, to the extent that it was for the most part. It depends on where you go, but. Uh, I think that um, most Greek organizations now are dedicated to, you know, principles of scholarship, community service, uh, personal development, uh, and, in, and it can be a very enriching experience if you allow yourself to, to be a part of it. Hmm. That sounds cool, actually. That sounds, that sounds nice. <laughs> yeah. So after you were through with that experience, um, where, where did you go? Uh, then I went to the University of Arizona College of Law. Hmm. Uh, that's a three-year program, and you uh, essentially go through a, a you know a, a curriculum that is intended to develop you in order to to pass the bar examination and become a lawyer. And why why did you want to become a lawyer? You know that's a that's a really interesting question. Yeah. You know I think. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, I see a lot of resumes come across my desk these days and you can see people who, uh, you know, their lives have been focused towards this and you can see folks whose lives might have been less focused toward it. It's funny you would ask because I was looking through some old papers the other day, you know, cleaning out stuff and I saw some letters I had written to my mom or I guess my mom gave them to me and I was looking through them and I was reporting to her from college how I was taking the entrance examination for, or I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, the, essentially the entrance, uh, entrance examination for, for law school, the uh, law school aptitude test or okay. LSAT. Um, so I must have been thinking about it in college, even mm. though right now I don't recall it all that much. Yeah. Um, but uh, for a lot of people, it's uh, you know, it's you know, if you're a rhetoric major uh, with a, a another major in social science, you know, maybe it's the fallback uh, fallback position. Physics is not going to be something that I'm going into. Um, but I was attracted to it uh, for a lot of different reasons, and uh, as I look back on it now, I'm I'm pretty happy about having. Uh, chosen that path. Mm, that's awesome. That's good. Was there anything else you were potentially interested in that you were kind of like juggling? Like, hey, maybe I should go this route or... Yeah. Um, well, even even as a lawyer, you have to focus on a, an area of interest. Mm -hmm, uh, going sure. into law school, I thought you know, I was going to be a real estate guy and mm. get together with maybe an accountant and a developer and, and go off and, you know, uh, pave the way for the, the next generation in Phoenix. Yeah. Uh, and as things go along, as you develop in, in law... Uh, you know they change, uh, but I was uh, I was open. I was open to 
where wherever that path was going to lead me and it led me down a different path to where I am today and uh, I'm happy it did I'm really mm. pretty satisfied with what I'm doing so did you have to choose pretty soon as far as uh, what what you were gonna study as far as law goes well you know uh, law is a lot like perhaps your experiences in college mm. as well you have these core subjects that everybody is required to take mm -hmm. uh, and which I hated <laughs> Well, you know, it's even more restricted in, in law school Is in it? some mm -hmm. ways. There, there are these core classes that uh, every student needs to take in order to develop this base knowledge that is necessary to pass the bar exam. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of law schools are geared toward that. You have a little bit less opportunity to develop your own curriculum to suit the interests that you have, mm -hmm. I think, than you do in college. One, because it's a more contracted process. You have three years. Uh, and two, there are just there's a lot more commonality with people who want to be lawyers and people who want to be a yeah. hundred million different things in college. Um, but there are plenty of opportunities to, uh, to develop an interest that you have in law school and, mm. uh, uh, and, and a lot of folks, a lot of folks are directed and, and do that. And I think it's important, uh, more so now than it probably was when I was going to school to, to be directed because law mm. has become, uh, in the last 25 years, a really super specialized type of profession where if you're not doing one thing really well, you're probably not doing anything very well. And people uh, have options to uh, get legal counsel that does things well. Hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Was it pretty, the environment, was it pretty competitive as far as when you were back then? Was it as far as I think, uh, I think all academic environments yeah. are generally competitive if you want to be successful and, and uh, perform at, at higher levels. You can mm -hmm. go through the motions, but uh, that's uh, not an option if you want to be successful as everything in, uh, at everything in life is you want to be successful with these podcasts. Yeah, know. definitely, definitely. So after you graduated, w w what, what happened? Where did you go? I uh, started out, um, uh, well, I had a summer associate job. One of the things you do in law school is if you're fortunate enough, you can get a job in the summertime that actually pays money. Okay. Uh, and I was lucky enough to do that at a, at a mid-sized firm called Robbins and Green, which is uh, no longer exists. Uh, at the end of those summers, they'll perhaps offer you a job. And I was fortunate enough to have a job offer made to me. And uh, after law school, I went and started working there. Awesome. And how long did you work for that, that firm, that law firm? Well, that's where I met my partner, Bill. Okay. Uh, we were, when I was a summer associate, he had asked me to do some work for him. Hmm. He liked my work. I liked working with him. And we developed a relationship that has been pretty enduring. Obviously, I'm still practicing with him. How long now. has it been that you both have been practicing? Uh, well over 20 years, 1995. Wow. Yeah. Long time. Wow. Awesome. And have you seen throughout your career, just business-wise, have you seen things increase? Or is it basically pretty much, it's always been steady as far as the amount of clients that you've had? Oh, uh, the evolution of a practice is a really interesting thing. Yeah. Everybody's practices evolve differently and develop differently. Uh, there are ups and downs in every practice. And it's it's... What you try to do, I think, over time is develop a specialty that you're interested in, that you're good at, and that gives you the ability to deliver good quality legal services to the people that you intend to serve. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And, and is I would imagine this is something that you're constantly, especially in the medical field, you're constantly having to learn and change right i would because there's new whatever procedures or new things that are happening so it's something you're, you're constantly having to change right it's a very stimulating intellectual exercise to hmm. do any kind of legal work hmm. i suspect that the work that i do is especially so the medicine is is changing all of the time but the lawyer's job is to know the medicine that exists in the case or the situation that they're dealing with. Hmm. It's not as if you can have this sort of incredible knowledge of all things medicine that yeah. you have to keep up on. 
even physicians in their super specialized practices can't keep up on everything that's going on in, mm -hmm. in just these limited areas. So for me, it's more important to learn the medicine and the issues that are involved with a particular case that I have or a particular situation that I'm dealing with. Mm -hmm. And that's where the challenge comes, not so much in keeping up with the day to day, the day to day changes. Yeah. Although the evolution of medicine and the evolution of science is unbelievable right now. It, it's exploding in a way that is fun to watch and fun to be a part of uh, just from a, an observational standpoint. Hmm. So I, I wanted to bring this up. I don't know if you've seen this. So this was a while ago on Netflix. I watched this series called The Bleeding Edge. Have you ever seen that before? You know, uh, that's been that's been commended to me and yeah. I have not oh, seen okay. it yet, uh, yeah. but I've heard about it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not better able to, no, no, to it was, comment on it. It was, it was interesting because this is kind of like the only one of the only because you know, I'm not well informed on, you know, what you do exactly. But one of the things I thought of that I wanted to ask you is uh, one of the, I can't remember how long this series was, but one of the episodes was they were putting um, these implants into people and whatever the metal that they were using was like, you know, leaching into the bloodstream of people. And like, they were going like nutty basically. So um, it was just interesting to see, uh, especially I think it was more about like the implant world and how uh, how whatever the FDA passes these and how quickly they can get into the market without um, you know, medical professionals really knowing how long term, how effective, you know, this implant is going to be like that was like crazy to me, you know, yeah. and um, I have never uh, had a surgery before in my life, but I'm like very like paranoid about that type of stuff. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, and it's like. Be watching 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 that stuff and like there's so many things like in our society right now whether it's like opioids or things like that i feel like people uh, might be a little more weary of of what you know doctors have to say nowadays versus like maybe before you know people just kind of went along with the program so um are there any is there like a lot of cases that you're seeing or I know you can't yeah. talk specifically about, you know, uh, I hear people, what you're but... saying. Uh, what you're talking about are really manufacturing issues and political issues and regulatory issues. A physician is only as good as the information that they're given. Uh, Oxycontin is a perfect example of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you recall now, you may recall uh, that just recently, it's, it's become a pretty big deal. Uh, opioid medication has been recognized as something that is really not very good, that uh, the drug manufacturers have been accused of, and rightly so, of promoting the overuse of this type of medication in patients uh, where they knew that the consequences would be bad. They would get addicted. They would have other kinds of bad things happen to them. And that's a kind of a, an example, I think, of perhaps what this movie is trying to, to bring out. Uh, physicians were sold on this product as being a good, safe, reliable product to control pain. The public was led to believe that pain control, these are effective pain control agents, and they are. But when you balance the benefits against the risks and the other alternatives out there, this was really not a very good thing. Yet the drug manufacturers made hundreds of millions of dollars, billions, of, hundreds of billions of dollars mm -hmm. selling these kinds of products. And that's what we really need to protect against. Uh, and our government, in a lot of ways, controls what's going to get out there and what's not. You're seeing it a little bit now in terms of the way that the restrictions on COVID medications and the development of COVID medications have been loosened and probably with good reason. Mm. Uh, perhaps not so much with breast implants or something like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, do you see a lot of issues that are, that are going to arise out of this whole like COVID situation? Or are you already seeing things that might happen in the future potentially? You know, uh, in my business, yeah. uh, I think that, and, and that's, this is from a medical negligence perspective. Mm -hmm. I think it will be very, very difficult to uh, suggest that uh, some sort of COVID related illness is the fault of a physician or that a physician or a healthcare provider generally 
didn't treat somebody the right way when they're putting their lives on the line every day, mm -hmm. exposing themselves to what can be a lethal disease, and, and then asking a jury, a member of their peers, to a group of their peers to say, you shouldn't have been doing that. You're at fault for this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's already extraordinarily difficult to get juries to find against doctors in these kinds of cases. And so from my perspective, in these kinds of cases, I think we're not going to see a whole lot of, of change. Uh, if anything, pardon me for a moment. Oh, yeah, of course. <coughs> Uh, if anything, I think that the, the halo that already exists over the heads of healthcare providers, and, and with good reason, mm -hmm. uh, is, is only going to grow. And in the eyes of a jury, uh, they will become uh, even, uh, they will, the jury will be uh, advocates for them in a way that they aren't already now. Because of this whole situation. And yes. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I totally get that too. What do you, what do you think about, um, do you have any like knowledge or, or opinion on uh, people who are like anti-vax type people? Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's absolutely nuts. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen the, the shows that the anti-vaxxer people give me and uh, they, they make no sense to me. Mm. Uh, if somebody wants to give each of those medicines individually, uh, by all means do that, but we need to have a herd immunity mentality. Mm. And in order to keep the herd healthy, we need to vaccinate. Uh, and to expose people who can't get vaccinations unnecessarily for a philosophical reason seems to me to be a, a, a very poor reason. Mm. Do, you, do you think the, do you think it's, oh yeah, <coughs> and I'm sorry. No, no, <laughs> you're all, you don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> do you, do you, I don't know if this is possible, but do you think there would ever be a situation where the the government could say like, you have to take this vaccination? Like we need well, they already to... do. Really? Uh, in, as far in... as like schools and stuff like that. Exactly. But you could homeschool technically. Like if you yes. really were like, okay, I don't want my child to take this vaccination. But do you think the government could ever say like, we need the whole population to take this vaccination for COVID? Mm -hmm. You do. Uh, constitutionally, I'm not sure if that is feasible. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a constitutional lawyer, uh, but uh, we enjoy certain freedoms and protections uh, that are, are protected by the Constitution. Uh, in terms of public health, the government is mandating that everybody wear masks right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure that there's perhaps much of a diff difference between that and something that's more invasive. Hmm. Do you, so you think the mass potentially, is that what you're saying? You think the mass potentially aren't doing as much for people as what they think they're doing? No, I'm just suggesting oh, that the government has mandated that oh. folks wear them much in the same way that you were asking whether they could mandate vaccinations yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, under you know any circumstances. Hmm. It's not an issue that I've thought a whole lot about, uh, yeah. but it's certainly worth consideration. Hmm. Crazy. So just for people who don't know, obviously the medical malpractice, that's kind of obvious. What, but as far as like personal injury or wrongful death, like what, what type of case is that exactly? It, it's all a hodgepodge of the same kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that you might see something like that on my website is so because the public tends to differentiate or different people see these terms in, in their own special way and although one term would probably capture everything, uh, you know, I use three. Okay. Uh, personal injury is just a case where somebody is injured and somebody else caused the injury and it was because they were acting unreasonably. Um, that's the only kind of personal injury case that is, that is uh, actionable, that you can bring a claim for. Mm. People injure other people all the time. It doesn't mean that they were what people hear the word negligent. Negligence just means that you're acting unreasonably. You're not doing what a reasonable person would do under the same or similar circumstances. Um, wrongful death is the same thing as personal injury. It just means that the conduct caused a death instead of an injury. And medical negligence is this really specific area of the law which can involve either injury or death, but it's limited to cases involving a health care provider and, and that uh, that group of people is specifically uh, uh, defined by statutes here in Arizona. Mm. Uh, and it's its own sort of specialized 
area of law because there are certain kinds of requirements that you need to satisfy in order to make your claims in these kinds of cases. And uh, they tend to be a little bit more interesting, squirrely, sophisticated. They mm. they demand a, a, a certain uh, knowledge base in order to be able to handle them successfully. So how, how many how many cases are you typically taking on like per year? Well, it, you know, that's hard to say. I mm. think, um, you know, anybody who's got more than, you know, seven or eight good cases at one time, medical negligence cases is probably going to be, you know, overextended. Mm. Uh, I will tell you that the cases are hard to find. Um, I Legitimate probably, ones. Well, the, the, any case that is brought by a good medical negligence lawyer is a legitimate case. Mm. The, the notion of frivolous lawsuits is, uh, it, that's a loaded term. Mm. It's sort of a dog whistle to uh, the tort reformers and, and the folks that would like to think that people doing the kind of work that I do are uh, ambulance chasers and, and out to make a buck. And no, there, was... are, there are folks out there like that. Mm. Um, uh, but I'm sorry. So no, no, I was just gonna say I thought I, I was meaning more towards or more, more as far as people coming to you thinking that they have uh, yeah some sort of a so not you taking it on necessarily. No, uh, I get I get what you're saying. So yeah. we're probably taking one out of two hundred to wow. two hundred cases that we look at, um, and I think that you know anybody doing this kind of work is gonna be probably right around the same ratio. So hmm. uh, of those two hundred cases. There's probably negligence in 180 of them, uh, but you need a lot of stars to fall into alignment in order to make a case like this viable because there are so many hurdles to get over. And I think what the public doesn't realize, uh, unless you've been the victim of medical negligence or you've had a, a loved one that's been the victim of medical mm -hmm. negligence or a friend, uh, is that uh, it, it happens a lot. Uh, really? It's one of the leading causes of death in the United States, oh believe God, it or don't not. Don't tell me that. Uh, terrible. And uh, but the barriers to making a recovery and being able to prove that somebody did something wrong are very significant in the medical legal world. Hmm. Wow, that's crazy. So it's just hard to it's hard to get. You, you have to have signific significant amount of evidence to be able to say, okay, this definitely was something that went wrong here and this person is in, in, in the wrong. But there's a lot of people that might not get any sort of, you know, um, whatever, vindication mm -hmm. for what had happened to them. or. Well, there are three uh, primary elements to really any personal injury, medical malpractice, wrongful death case. Mm. Uh, first, there's the issue of liability. In a medical negligence case, there are two prongs to that. One is that there has to be a deviation from the standard of care, and this is technical legal jargon. But mm -hmm. what that means is that the healthcare provider had to act unreasonably. Hmm. Uh, and so you need an unreasonable act by a healthcare provider in order to, in order to begin the process. Uh, an unreasonable act means that they did something that no other reasonable healthcare provider would do under the same or similar circumstances. That can be an exceedingly high bar because there's a lot of ways to do something in life, uh, and mm -hmm. medicine is certainly no exception. It's an art and a science in many ways, and a jury is going to give a healthcare provider a lot of leeway in deciding what the best approach is to address any kind of medical situation. Hmm. And oftentimes these decisions are made very quickly under very difficult and trying circumstances. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so that, that is one, one element. The next element is causation. People do things wrong all the time. Uh, you know, you probably drove over the speed limit sometime yeah. today. I, I know I did, right? Yeah. Um, that's against the law. Uh, but nothing bad happens. And people in medicine, as in life, do things that are below the standard of care that they shouldn't be doing, but it doesn't cause any harm. And what you have to do is prove a direct relationship between that deviation from the standard of care, between that negligence and some harm. Medicine can be very complex, and there can be lots of different reasons 
especially when you're getting healthcare treatment under difficult circumstances, that a bad result, uh, that you end up with a bad result. And it may, it may be a compilation or a combination of bad conduct and something else. Mm-hmm. So teasing that out and defining this one event, this one negligent event uh, as the cause of something can be difficult to do because there are many, oftentimes there are many causes or many explanations for something. So tying that together is hard. And then you need damages. Uh, And in these kinds of cases, you need significant damages because these cases are very expensive. uh, and, And unless you can get a good result for your client, they can be exposed to having to pay the physician or the physician's insurance company mm-hmm. for the costs uh, of the lawsuit if, if you lose. Wow. Uh, and so you need to have all of those three elements come together. Lots of times somebody will have something bad happen to them and they recover in a week or two and, and they're all better. That's probably not a, a, going to be a good case or at least not a viable case because mm-hmm. the costs uh, to get there are so extreme and the costs of the case may be more than trying to get a settlement from mm-hmm. an insurance company. Yeah, okay. So those are the three things you need. So is it mostly <clears throat> an insurance company that is somebody, or is it also doctors as well that, that could be responsible legally for some sort of situation going wrong? Because I would imagine like you would see it more so as far as like the opioid thing. More doctors would be doing something wrong versus like a surgeon who was like, a terrible surgeon is just like, is that true? Or do you see that as well? Where it's like a surgeon who is, has this history of, of, uh, bad actions. Sure. Sort of two different issues. Uh, most healthcare providers are going to have some form of insurance coverage. Mm. If you're out there and you're in a group of physicians that's practicing, you're going to have, you're going to generally, you're going to have coverage. If you're a nurse or a respiratory technician, someone like that, you're probably working for a, a larger healthcare provider, and we have three or four of those in town. So they're going to have some sort of coverage, and and those are the companies. Those companies are the ones that will pay to defend the actions of these mm-hmm. folks if if they get sued. Cool. And so I think that's sort of yeah, what definitely, you were yeah, yeah, at. exactly, yeah. yeah. I just don't know all the technical <laughs> stuff, so yeah, yeah, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. trying to say. Uh, what about as far as, have you ever seen, I know, again, you don't probably want to go in specifically, but is there, cause I, I would, what you do is an important thing and, you know, you would hope that there's not people out there that are, um, not performing in intentionally hurting people, but I, I'd imagine that happens. So, I mean, do you see that where there's, there's this, or have you seen that where potentially there's this, there's this doctor who is just not performing well or do do these hospitals do they take care of these situations pretty quickly because they know they're liable for this person i think overall that uh, the expectation of good health care is is probably not a a reasonable one mm-hmm. i recommend to anybody that if you are hospitalized that you have an advocate with you that you have somebody there to watch you a friend a family member because bad things can happen and and these folks are overworked and overloaded and they don't always keep track of, of what's going on. Mm. Uh, the, the, the people that I, there, there are really two things that I think I do. One is the, the people that I help are generally people that need the help. And when I say help, what I can do is get money for them. That's all I can do for the most part, given there are some, some exceptions to that. But that's what lawyers do. Uh, and the people that I help generally need the money either because they have you know, long-term medical expenses or they've lost a loved one and they've lost an income stream that they were dependent on. Uh, the other thing that I do is tell people that they don't have a viable case. I bet I bet 50% of the people that call me want to know that their healthcare provider didn't do anything wrong, or at least if they did, that it wasn't something that was bad enough or that the circumstances weren't going forward. Mm-hmm. Suing a healthcare provider is an extraordinarily difficult thing. It's mentally taxing. It's emotionally taxing. People don't want to do it. Uh, and, and 
a lot of folks just want to have the peace of mind knowing that somebody has told them who knows what they're talking about that uh, that they don't have a case, that they shouldn't pursue this person or that the person really didn't do anything wrong and that can give them some peace of mind, especially if it's the loss of a loved one, that, uh, that things happen the way that they were supposed to happen and not because anybody did something wrong. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's amazing. So I'd imagine, like you said, you're very passionate about you, what you do. Is this, do you ever see yourself retiring or is this like, this is your lifelong career? Oh, I think everybody wants to retire someday. Yeah. Uh, I think that the, the, the work that I do is, is certainly very engaging and it demands uh, a, a, a full-time commitment of intellectual energy and, and emotional energy. Yeah. It's also something that's extraordinarily rewarding. When you when you get a good result for somebody that needs your help, uh, that needs this money, mm. uh, that you know you're going to make a significant change in their life, uh, but that that can't be anything less than fulfilling. Mm. Uh, and it's it's a, a, one of the enjoyable parts of the practice. Do you ever see it? this? This probably isn't something that you you deal with, but do you do you ever see people that come? come to you with like excessive medical debt is that any anything that um you're involved with uh well you know that comes up in in an interesting way in these kinds of cases mm. uh it's um i don't know if you've heard of medical liens but no. there are uh insurance companies uh health care providers medicare medicaid all of these folks have liens against any medical recovery that you make to the extent that they have paid money for health care that was required as the result of the health care provider's negligence. So if mm -hmm. the doctor does something bad to you, let's just use an ex easy example and say, mm -hmm. cuts off your arm no. uh, and you now need treatment to fix that, mm -hmm. um, the person or the company that pays for that treatment can say, if you recover from the doctor, I get a piece of that. Oof. Uh, and that is an extraordinarily complex uh, and difficult area of the law to navigate. It's a part of, it's a significant part of what I do. And negotiating those kinds of claims down to maximize the amount of money that I can put in somebody's pocket uh, is, 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 is a lot more important part of the job than, than most folks realize. Most folks are shocked to learn that uh, a hospital or you know a uh, an insurance company may have a claim uh, to their uh, to their recovery, uh, and it could be a very significant claim, and it could mm -hmm. be a claim that results in putting more money in the pocket of the insurer than it does in the pocket of the client, and that's unfortunately the way that uh, our laws are written. Hmm. Is there is there any advice to people that you might give that just as far as things you've seen? Um, about the medical industry? Is there anything that you wish you could change that you've seen within our, our system? Oh, gosh. Sure there's a lot. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, you you could, I mean, you could write a, a you know, an encyclopedia yeah. uh, about, about those kinds of things. Yeah. But I think if you are a careful and cautious consumer, that's the place to start. Uh, mm -hmm. if, if you need, and if you need some particular kind of health care and you have the ability and the time to, to figure out where you want to get that care from before you get it, mm. that would be the best place to start. And, uh, you know, e even physicians now acknowledge their patients probably know more about them, uh, about more, more than they do about certain kinds of conditions that they, uh, that they're treating because mm -hmm. we have the ability to learn so much information on the internet, not only about our, you know, our, our conditions, but mm -hmm. also about the people that, treat those conditions mm. and that's the place to start just being a well-informed mm. consumer is uh i know you said you, you have uh one child a daughter or uh... i have two kids daughter two kids. and a son okay how i know one you said college uh, 17 and 19 okay yeah. are they interested in the the legal not even a little bit no really <laughs> i know uh my daughter is interested in um you know some sort of uh, uh, some sort of uh, biology in the brain, mm, cool. uh, and my son is a computer scientist. Oh wow, awesome, yeah. very cool. And what is there anything as far as just like activities 
what do you like doing out in here in Arizona? Well, uh, what do you like about Arizona? I don't know Arizona? if it comes through on your video, but I'm yeah. obviously quite tan. Yeah, you're like a hiker. <laughs> and uh, so I do a lot of mountain biking and a lot of swimming. I swim at lunch. That's my release. Really? And oh, cool. uh, so, uh, yeah. and I enjoy the outdoors. Arizona is a great place to do it. Oh, yeah. uh, and you can do it in the summer and the winter. We got skiing right up north and yeah. biking right down south. Can't yeah. beat it. Is that what that, that's kind of what keeps you sane doing these other activities? Uh, well, keeps you focused and able to do what you do at a high level. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm certain that that contributes. I do it just mm. because there are things. These are things that I enjoy, and yeah. uh, I enjoy living a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and and fortunately, I enjoy doing these kinds of activities. That yeah. uh, you know, per, perhaps uh, I, I need to wear more sunscreen. I do my very best, oh, but there's only so much you can do, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's I don't know. Hopefully you won't take offense to this, but when I first saw your picture online, I thought you looked like a, like a Kennedy. <laughs> Have you heard that before? A lot. Yeah. Have you? Oh, okay. I'll take I'll take a compliment where I can get it, and I take those as compliments. Is there anything that you're um, as far as besides? Obviously, I'm sure your job takes up a large portion of your time. But is there anything um, on the side that you're interested? Do you think that is interesting about this current point in history or where we're at now? I know you said a lot of interesting things are going to be happening you know, like medically tech from a technology standpoint, is there anything that you see that you're like, Oh, that's interesting. You know, uh, there are so many interesting things yeah. out there. Uh, and science is really, we are in such a wonderful period of time to mm. be experiencing science and the benefits that, that, that it's providing us, whether it's computer technology, whether it's our ability to peer into the universe whether it's our ability to understand the human body, um, you know, in terms of medicine, stem cells, mm -hmm. that stuff is is just going to be uh, crazy nuts in terms of the the way that medicine will develop and the things that those those kinds of technologies, those medical technologies, are going to allow us to uh, to treat people and to be healthier and live longer. Have you ever had any like stem cell injections or anything like that? Or? I have not. No, no. Okay. Um, but uh, I mean, I read a lot about it. Um, yeah. The 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 closest personal contact I had was uh, my dad, who died of cancer, oh, wow. uh, had a stem cell transplant, uh, and obviously it didn't it didn't work, or at least not for very long. Mm. But they're they're doing these kinds of uh, that was fifteen years ago. Uh, so much further ahead of the curve mm. again it's 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 almost a log logarithmic progression yeah. in terms of the knowledge that we have and the scientists that are out there doing this kind of research uh what what a great place for them to be and and we are so lucky to be able to live in a time where we can benefit from from those efforts yeah what um what was because i i don't i don't know what the curl current like legal standing here is as far as like the stem cells i know it's not like totally do you know what the laws are is it completely i know it's not like totally certain are you type, talking type about of stem embryonic cells? tissues yeah there's a certain yes. type okay yes uh well currently um embryonic tissue that has been harvested already is is uh, can be used for scientific purposes mm, okay wow and he he got this did he have to go out of the country or was he here oh he, no, I, I'm talking in terms of uh, stem cell research, stem cell development. Yeah, okay. This is uh, stem cells are uh, th that's embryonic tissues. Yeah. Stem cells are uh, anybody can make stem cells. Okay. Yeah, that's, but that's supposed to be like a higher quality, right? As far as that's what people originally when that came out, people did not like that. Well, um, stem cells are st cells that they can kind of tease into doing a lot of different things. So they're like these base cells, and you can. Uh, tease them into making eye tissue or nose tissue or hair tissue or <clears throat> uh, or, or tissues that um, uh, that fights cancerous tumors. Okay. Um, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. Is there anything else? Uh, like I said, anything else technology? Have you heard of, um, uh, I'm sure you know, you know who Elon Musk is? You know, <laughs> Tesla guy? Of course. So the company, one of the companies he has, what he's working on, I could see how it'd be interesting for somebody like you where... It's called like a Neuralink where they want to, I think to start, it's just going to be something that's like an implant and it's going to help people, I don't know, maybe who have like seizures or other types of conditions, but eventually down the road, they think that that's something that could like, 
connect with the human brain or something like that? Do you think that's possible? Yeah. Oh, ab well, absolutely. I mean, there, there's yeah. already uh, scientific research where, where people have had brain implants and been able to generate computer images, fuzzy as they may be, of of, of objects by thinking about them. Really? Uh, you know, we're, really? we're just, we're, we're at the cusp of this. We're so mm -hmm. far uh, above where we were 10 or 15 years ago, and yeah. you can imagine 100 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's going to be a, log, a logarithmic acceleration. It, it, there is no limit to, this. our brains are just chemical computers. Yeah. Uh, and we all have this sort of unique chemical cocktail that fuels our thinking and our life experience and the way that we perceive and react to things. Uh, and it, it can all be decoded. Uh, yeah. So but it's just a matter of the amount of computing power that you need to do that. That's interesting. I wonder what type of something like that. I'm sure it's going to take a lot of regulation to get that out into the mainstream. But um, I'm sure for you, maybe, you know, this might be something that comes up years from now, but maybe people starting to, to have more technology integrated with whatever medical type situation they might have going on and how that could you know result in a god who knows what but uh we already have it, it yeah. it's you know it's in everything you know um uh the artificial pancreas you know mm. is going to come out and and perhaps cure diabetes the really? uh uh you know people have exos ex exoskeletons they have yeah. uh, endoskeletons they have implants they have you know uh, artificial hearts uh we've got an amazing amount of technology that we're already uh, using in terms of medicine. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's, it's again, it's, it's going to be really, really fun and interesting to watch how it all evolves, at least during our lifetimes. And you have a few more years to watch it. Than yeah. I do. Yeah. Would you want, if you could, would you want to live like if, let's say 20 years from now, we have some real, which I'm sure we will, some medical breakthroughs. Would you want to live past like 100 years old if you could? Sure. Why not? Yeah. As long as possible. I don't know. Long as possible is a long time. Yeah. But uh, it's fun to watch what's going on now. Yeah. And I hope that I have the same intellectual curiosity uh, when I'm 80 as I do when I'm 50. Yeah. Beautiful. It's is, like altered carbon. Yeah. There's so many different like, I don't know if you're into like, there's some black mirror, like all these different sort of like sci-fi stuff. But that's why, like you said, I think it's amazing. And I'm sure your son's super interested in this. What's going to, like 50 years from now, like what is our life going to be like? I can't even imagine. It's crazy. Well, you may overestimate a 17-year-old. He's just interested in video game yeah. development at the moment. So. But still, <laughs> that's huge. Because who knows? I mean, where is that going to go? People are talking about, you know. AI. He's, yeah, and VR. We're all going to be, you know, yeah. living in virtual reality pretty soon. It seems that way. Yeah. <laughs> for better or worse. So uh, if people would like to find you, where, where, where can they find you? You can go to the internet and just yeah. look up my name, J-O-H-N-A-G-E-R. Uh, and that's probably the easiest way to find me. I should be a pretty pretty high hit on Google. Yeah, awesome. Hell yeah. Was well, there anything else you'd like to say? I, I really appreciate your time. And again, hopefully this wasn't totally boring for you. I don't know, you know, I don't have the deep knowledge like you do, but I think it's very interesting what you do. And I think it's... I think it's incredibly important. Um, I'm sure you've helped a lot of people, so that's beautiful, man. Yep. I hope people watch your webcast, yeah. and I uh, <laughs> hope that they uh, that they find the information that I was able to share useful. Yeah, and, cool. Uh, you know, and, and that they leave feeling feeling good about what they heard. Yeah, cool. All right, John Auger, thank you very much, everybody. Just to let uh, real quick, um, obviously the coronavirus this has affected what we're doing, but hopefully here eventually we're going to be posting a little more regularly. So. Uh, We'll get that figured out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Adios. for having me.